Dome Dynasty is brought to you by... COVID-19 is now confirmed in central Iowa. Number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in our state jumped by 23 overnight. Spring sports have been canceled, ending the season for approximately 45,000 high school athletes across Iowa. South Sioux City High School student tonight has tested positive for COVID-19. All practices are being suspended until August 18th. You know, my biggest concern, I guess, would be, uh, you know, Probably not if it's going to happen, but when someone tests positive. I think the biggest fear is, is, you know, you get one case and what impact can that have on, on an entire program? And no case is ever the same. I mean, you, you start looking at, okay, who could have been exposed and, and the contact tracing that you do. And, you know, all of us are masking now, um, you know, and the, the six foot for 15 minutes, you know, I, I think that's a rule of thumb, but it's not like it's written in stone. You just kind of hold your breath and, you know, shutting down would be a tough one to swallow. Is there a fear there? Yeah, the fear is, is that, you know, we have to go through another season without sports, but there's also that optimism and that confidence there that we are changing what we're doing. Just like how we've changed how we coach the game in the last five to 10 years to make it a safer game when it comes to injuries, especially the head injuries, you know? We're doing some things right now, to be honest with you, we probably should have been doing certain cleaning techniques like this five, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I, I think those are the things that make me feel good about what we're attempting. Let's go, let's go. Don't be satisfied. State championship leader. It's a long, old road. First five minutes, we'll be like a boxing match. I want it for four quarters. I want to have some fun tonight. I want you men to experience fun tonight. Tough guys can handle it. Done. That play's over. Don't worry about anything but yourself and your team. Play with heart, play with courage, play with conviction. You gotta come out swinging right off the bat. Keep swinging until this game is done. Enjoy the moment. Champions! Two weeks from tonight, you gotta walk out of that field and play a game. It's August 2020. Iowa high school football practice begins in the midst of a pandemic. This is the world that we live in nowadays, all right? So be really smart. It's a delicate challenge preparing for the season while a deadly virus is spreading across the world. There is no playbook for COVID-19. You've got to be ready to be wrong, you know? Uh, and, and I think probably the biggest challenge of this whole thing for me has been the, the lack of definitive information. You know, that w we know for a fact that if you do this, then this is gonna happen. We're dealing with a, a virus that is confounding. You know, it, we have not been able to to nail it down yet. I think, you know, when this stuff all hit, I was like a lot of people and it was just a little shock. And I think to be honest with you, I was like, we'll be okay by June. You know, we'll, we'll have this, you know, time period where everything goes on kind of restriction. And then by the time summer rolls around, we'll get it figured out. And I coached track in the spring. And I think it, it, it losing that season kind of put me on alert a little bit because as we got to June and July and things weren't, going to where I thought they would be, it started to make me think a little differently about how the fall might go with football. You're just thinking more about track and how, you know, how are we gonna get through a track season and explain to our kids, we're gonna be okay, just keep taking one day at a time. And we leave for spring break and we come back and all of a sudden track is gone. And, you know, to try to have closure with a group of seniors on the track team was tough. And so we've used that as kind of fuel for our football team is like, just go talk to those spring sports about what it's like to lose your senior season. And if, if you could go back and do something, would you do it? And they, they all said yes. I was skeptical. I, I didn't, I mean, football is such a contact sport. And with this uh, pandemic, especially football, I, I didn't think we'd get through a football season. And I just told my wife, I go, there's no way we're playing. There's no way. I feel a little bit of hesitation 
you know, with, with my colleagues, uh, primarily because I think they're waiting for somebody else to make, you know, once the dominoes start falling, the, you know, they're gonna fall one way or the other. Administrators in schools are in an unprecedented challenging time. And I do not envy them because every decision they make is gonna be met with disagreement and displeasure and disappointment from somebody. And they're gonna hear it. We try to stay two years ahead. You can't hardly stay two days ahead right now, you know, and that's probably the the number one thing that I think a lot of us struggle with is is always wanting to try to be proactive and and be detailed in your planning, um, but then have you know legitimate curveballs and changeups get thrown at you, you know, where you got to be able to adjust. As we start putting all of our pro protocol in place and trying to really get the kids to understand because people are across the board on this. You know, some are scared to death and while others think it's really not that big a deal, but you know, no matter what you think, we have things that we have to do in order to be able to keep people as safe as possible. And even though following the protocols, um, really you just hold your breath and, and I think you have to get a little bit lucky. We're built to run stuff. We're not built to cancel, we're built to run. So every opportunity we get, we need to make decisions that help us move forward with conducting our season. Everything that we have always done, it's not going to be done that way this year. You know, all the good team building activities that we have of getting people together, whether, you know, it's something within our teams or it's the parent parties and things like that, those aren't going to happen. We're either going to find out that um, between the lines, sports is safe and that when you have protocols in place, you're going to be all right. If, if the COVID cases sort of traject up as a result of playing football uh, or running cross country or, or, or golf or, or swimming. If we see that, then is it the sport specific? Uh, and then if, if it is, then it makes you say, which, what are we gonna do about basketball? What are we gonna do about wrestling? You know, if it's not, if we find that through contact tracing that these cases continue to come from outside the program and not get spread through the program, then we, we can say the protocols that are in place make a difference. The virus is forcing everyone to institute these new procedures. No school is immune. We are starting school on the 26th of August and we are asking every teacher, every kid to wear a mask in school. We're setting up procedures where they can have backpacks and, and, and not have to go to their locker room as much. We're trying to make it so they can socially distance, spread out in class. Um, teachers are, have been told they can take their kids outside to get mass breaks and, and be able to, to social distance outside and teach. Still doing group learning, still doing our normal thing, but just being smarter about, about what we do. Uh, classroom doors will stay open so we aren't touching door handles, disinfecting desks as much as possible. As long as we you know, do what we're, you know, we're asked to do, I think we're going to be okay. You hear the NBA talking now about the bubble. You hear these groups talking about trying to isolate. You know, your school and your community is kind of your bubble. And how people choose to interact within that community right now, I think is really important. We've talked a lot with our kids this fall about, you know, you've had a bubble of, of social interaction all summer. That's probably a pretty good place to stay right now. And our biggest fear when school starts is when we bring all those kids back into school and we've chose the hybrid method to start. So we're only gonna have half the kids here at a time there's going to be a lot more people that kids have been around that they haven't been around. So that's a concern. Just kind of revamping what we've always done and changing it to fit 2020. And uh, it's that constant communication and it seems like every week something changes. But just we, we've been telling our football coaches and our, and our players three things, adapt, modify and overcome. Whatever, we, whatever gets thrown at us, we got to adapt to it. We got to overcome challenges and we got to modify and make it work so we can have a season. The way that we're we're going about things is, is we're self-screening uh, all of our kids. You know, we're, we're taking their temperature right now. Um, we're asking them the questions that go along with the screen. You know, if a student does uh, either A, have a fever, or B, answers yes to one of those questions, we're sending them home, doing a follow-up. Um, uh, and then what we're doing is, is making sure that our coaches report back to myself or to the school nurse um, that they may have an issue, and, and uh, then she'll report or to the uh, county health department and we'll take it from there um, so there's there's a there's a, a little bit of a checks and balances and I think you just try to hope that you know people aren't trying to hide anything and they're and they're um, being honest with their screens and and um, you know you don't want it to turn into a, a situation where 
uh, you know, students are hiding things just to be able to get their feet on the field and play because that could snowball into something, you know, pretty pretty big. We use the Varsity Bound app uh, just for to get a, an idea of how they're feeling for that day. All of them have to do that. And I think mine came to me at 6.30 this morning. Our assistant trainer uh, pushes that out. I've kind of let her take the lead on that. And really, she's trouble shot that with several of our kids. But they have to check in with us. And you know, you might get somebody that says they have muscle soreness. Well, that can mean a lot of things in the sport of football. Um, but obviously, if somebody has a sore throat or they've been vomiting, um, you know, the days of having them tough it out um, are over. Um, you know, I used to tell kids, hey, don't worry about it. We'll just schedule the games on the days you feel well. And, you know, we really can't do that anymore. I think for the most part, the school districts understood that, you know, every school district that I covered, that, you know, the safety of the people involved, not just the student body, but also the, the people coming to watch them, the parents, the grandparents, uh, had to be, you know, you had to make sure that they were safe. You had to uh, pro follow the proper protocol to make sure that would happen. I think it's important that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves because when you do that, then you make decisions that, um, you know, th that, that are based on what you assume or think is going to happen out here. And there's a long period of time, and in this COVID, two weeks is a long period of time. There's a long period of time between this and getting here. And I think if you would have, a good example is if you would have asked anybody in March, do you think in August we would still be dealing with this? They'd say, you're crazy. That's that, no way. This thing is going to be handled and it's going to be, we're going to be fine. We talked to our kids. We've got three words on our practice jersey, uh, passion, sacrifice, and loyalty. And it really comes down, do you have a passion for this game? And if you do, you're going to make those sacrifices that are required for us to have a season. And that's going to show true loyalty to your teammates, to your coaches, and to your school. If you're willing to do those things, it isn't going to be easy, but it's going to be what's required of you. It's patience, uh, flexibility, and grace, you know, from your, from your community, okay, from your coaches, from your athletes. Um, and as long as everybody's willing to give uh, or to have patience, you know, to be flexible and to give grace, uh, we're going to be okay. The Iowa High School Athletic Association is allowing some changes. The leaders have outlined a plan that will allow all teams into the playoffs this season. Our staff um, had some conversations around what if this thing doesn't settle down by the fall? What are, what are we going to do? And Todd Tharp came to us uh, back in May uh, in early June with an idea. And he said, uh, so if we have to, if, if this thing's still around and, and we're struggling with football, here's an idea. Why don't we have, why don't we have a five game schedule, let everybody in the playoffs, and lo and behold, that's exactly where we landed. Five games, plus you could add two if you wanted. You could do two more. And uh, when we did that, we felt like we had, uh, we had given schools the opportunity to be flexible because RPI didn't matter anymore and everybody was going to get in the playoffs. What a great way to start knowing that we're still preparing for the playoffs and we're, we're going to make ourselves better each week. We've got a young football team. Um, there's going to be a lot of great teams in this area. Um, you know, I think our goal is, is we're going to be a heck of a lot better at the end of the year than what we are right now. And, and then you help you have yourself a fighting chance. While the state of Iowa forges ahead with a plan to play, other states are in limbo. The news inspires some high profile players to transfer to Iowa to play their final year. Some of the biggest names, two players from the same high school in Kansas, Iowa recruit Arlen Bruce and Kansas commit Dale Stout. Bruce enrolled in Ankeny and Stout in Waukee. Him to come in was just a huge thing for us and I actually went the Sunday he came in, I already started to throw with him at the field so we could just get used to it. And, uh, you know, he's a great guy and uh, it was a great addition for us. I was scared that right when I got here that I would maybe be sent back home because everyone else in the country wasn't playing football. But, man, I'm just glad how it all worked out. The two are slated to meet in week two. Another transfer headliner is future Kansas State quarterback Jake Rugley. He enrolled at West Des Moines Valley, and his father, TJ, was a prep star in Iowa and played in the NFL. 
it was like the rich getting richer. Some of the, the better schools were getting some of this better talent. I mean, if I was a great athlete and I couldn't play in the state of Kansas or wherever, Nebraska or California, wherever I was coming in from, I was going to pick the better coaching staff, the better school, the better program. So it's just the way it is. And, you know, but still, I, I mean, I'm glad we gave those young people an opportunity to compete because it would have been a wasted year for them. And if they wanted to assume the risk that was involved in coming here, you know, more power to them. Every program's a little bit different. Every coach has to make that decision. Uh, we haven't had to worry about that yet, but I, I see both sides. I, I see a, a four-year kid who's been working to become a starter, and they've earned that right. At the same time, I, I understand a kid that's worried about losing a senior year of football and and giving kids an opportunity to play, and I think there's, there's got to be a, a balance in there somewhere. If a kid shows up and, and he meets all those requirements and, uh, you know, they, they have a reason for why they've done it, you know, I think you as a coach owe that kid an opportunity just like you would anybody else that shows up uh, at your doorstep uh, during any other regular summer. In June, I started to get contacted by parents of players from out-of-state schools who had canceled their season who, or who had postponed their season. And those families didn't want to wait around to see if there was going to be, be a season there. Landon Nelson from San Luis Obispo High School in California was the first family to contact us. And we, we explained the, the rules in Iowa and they said, we're, we're going to move. We're ready to move. They had, a, they had a daughter that was going to be going to Iowa State, so they were ready to relocate. And they did, and they're still here. They're, they're making their home here. It was just another part of the 2020 season that made it different than anything we'd ever dealt with before. I'm not sure I can speak to everybody else's situation. You know, for, for us, um, I think it's somewhat cut and dry because the Athletic Association has a transfer form. You either meet the criteria of the transfer form or you do not. And uh, given our situation at Dowling and what we get accused of all the time anyway, um, you know, we, we do that to a T. And uh, I had gotten all the information together and it sat on my desk uh, because I was waiting for somebody to call. And uh, lo and behold, I get the phone call and you know, somebody's questioning something and, and uh, I send it to the Athletic Association and in our case, I get approval. Um, the other situations, um, I don't know that much about, it's all rumor. So if I don't, if I don't specifically know the, the circumstances, there's no use to really comment on it. We've had transfers move into the state for years, just not because of COVID. Uh, most of them aren't coming because they're getting away from something or but they're coming because their dad got a new job or the mom got a position or, you know, the family moved for whatever reason. We have administrative code that covers it. So if your family comes, you know, you, you left your life there and now your life is here, you're eligible. There are a lot of parts to this. And again, we, we depend on our administrators to do their due diligence. This is high profile. People are watching. So make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do when it comes to eligibility. I'm Danny, I've worked for Mackinac Corporation for six years as an operator. Like a little kids playing the sandbox for a living. About all there is to it, it's a lot of fun. I wish someone would have told me at 18 when I graduated high school that I could come work here and make decent money and run equipment all day. There's a plenty of ladders you can climb here. I mean, you can go, I mean, there's sewer side, there's dirt side, there's all kinds of different machines you can run. I recommend it. I recommend it to everyone that I know that's still in high school. It's a good company to work for. Come join the Mackinac team. I really enjoy women's imaging procedures and enjoy connecting with women and providing their health care. So um, I tend to do mostly women's imaging procedures and interpretations. The focus that we have for patient care, it's uh, a group of people with integrity and compassion and work here because they really care about people and care about radiology. To be cutting edge for the patients and to be a part of a multidisciplinary team that provides exactly what a patient needs. 
So we, we really have people who are interested in doing a great job and stay current in radiology and care about getting to know people here and making the experience as comfortable as it can be. Our long-standing promise, Stein has yield, proven by research and strengthened by the expertise of our dedicated workforce. This approach has resulted in the highest yielding corn and soybean seeds in the industry. It's why we are here today, and it's what will continue to propel us and our growers into the future of agriculture. Yield plus our determination, innovation, and performance makes Stein a leader in the field. This is Yield Plus. Yield expected, yield delivered. Stein has yield. Just as everyone starts to get comfortable, a different player enters the state, Mother Nature. You can see that main core of the storms just to the east of Carroll. We haven't seen a storm hit central Iowa this hard, I don't know, ever, maybe. It was like a hurricane went through, basically. Wind speeds went up to 126 miles per hour. A derecho levels Iowa. This land hurricane does billions in damage and shuts down several programs. I woke up a week ago Monday saying it's going to be a great day, I get to coach. And then an Iowa hurricane comes through and, and knocks out power, knocks down trees, and we can't have practice on the first day. And so it was, it's kind of understanding that football, it can be taken away. It became one more challenge. And, uh, you know, so it's one thing to say, how do you deal with devastation from a major storm like this? Uh, but now you got to figure out how do you deal with devastation of a major storm like this in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, it was a double whammy on some of, some of those areas and, uh, you know, it was, it was just heartbreaking. People that hadn't been in Cedar Rapids or Eastern Iowa, they have no idea of really what the destruction was. It's, un it's unbelievable. Every single property in Cedar Rapids was damaged somehow, you know, some more than others, but uh, it, it was an unbelievable thing and our kids have been battling through that and some of all the other high schools in Cedar Rapids. It's, I can't even describe it, you know, in, unless you're there. We had kids go out all last week and help uh, cut down trees and remove trees off of driveways and, and help out the community uh, where that we're teaching them how to be young men and how to grow up and how to handle responsibility. So the game of football's here, it's fun. We, we try to preach, you know, we wanna make sure we have fun out here uh, because we just don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. We get to go out and play football tonight, okay? And if we, we know that we don't know what happens after that, let's make it the best night of practice we can possibly have. All schools are eligible to take the field. However, when school does resume, that could change. There's this funnel of decisions, right? So. Uh, the legislature, the governor, the Department of Ed and the Department of Public Health and us and then, you know, schools when it comes to activities. Until that official first day of school, there's nothing that says they can't compete. Uh, now, once that day comes and it's 100% virtual, then it's got to shut down. If two weeks later, a school district that had been 100% virtual goes hybrid, they're back in the game. If a school that's hybrid, says, you know what, we see our cases going like this, we're going 100% virtual. Then they're done with sports at that point, face-to-face. Uh, -face. So there could be a lot of movement. People have an opinion about what, you know, about, about the DE coming out with their guidance, about us following that guidance. People have an opinion about that. On September 3rd, another opinion is gonna be shared, and that's gonna be the opinion of a judge. And, and then we live with whatever opinion that is. Uh, so we are, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to disown this. We're owning it. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're following, we choose to follow the DE guidance. Here come the Tigers! The unknown journey begins week one. Powerhouse West Des Moines Valley and transfer Jake Rubley host Des Moines Roosevelt. The Rough Riders are a metro school on the rise and head into the opening two weeks wondering if their season will continue if Des Moines schools open online only. Well, I had a conversation with Mitch Moore before the game about the fact that they weren't sure they were gonna get to complete the season. They had two weeks where they knew they could play, but it, it, it was tough for them. They were, they were, we were all happy to be there in week one. It's always been bigger than just football. Okay, it's about making Roosevelt football's platform as big as we can be so your voices can be heard. How do we do that? We perfect the habits that we've been given for the last five months. We perfect them tonight. Great communication. Play with discipline. Play with your eyes. Play for the brother next to you. We perfect our habits 
we've built for the last five months, and we beat this team. We have a lot of respect for this Roosevelt team. They're really good, and they're well coached, and this is going to be a lot better football game than people saying one versus unranked. That's, that's not where we're at. We're pretty even right here, first game of the year. We've got 22 new starters. It's going to be a better game than, than people think. It's going to be a really well, well played football game. Emotionally, I'm really happy that we're getting to play, especially this last couple weeks, last couple days with the cases really blowing up. We are really, I don't have my mask on because I'm back from you guys, but we are really pushing. Our kids have done a great job of wearing their masks and six foot social distancing. And, and I'm just happy to see them get to play. Straight back, wants to pass, has a man wide open, and this one's going to be a touchdown. Fourth and seven, they're going to score. That's Koger. Rudely. Down the sideline. Airs it out and right on the money to Nesheim who catches it and takes it out of bounds at about the five yard line. At the five, Rubley, Williams cuts back, dives into the end zone, touchdown Tigers. This is Williams, makes a couple of guys miss, bounces out left side, too fast for the first two defenders down the sideline, dives, stretches, oh he's out of bounds at the one. Second down and goal, Rubley wants to keep it again. Lunging forward, pushing, did he get in? Yes. Patton, Koger, bounces out, left side. Quickly, down the hash, towards the end zone. He's gonna make it. Rubley, back to pass, fires a bullet right side in the end zone and it's complete to Mahoney for a touchdown. Running right, running, getting away from defenders for the corner of the end zone, he gets it. Rubley, handoff, Williams up the middle, dragging defenders towards the goal is he in? Touchdown. Oh. Rubley, fake. Back to pass, fires end zone, right on the money. 22 yard touchdown pass. Well, this was awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just good to be out with some kind of normal Friday night. You know, it's just been that kind of year. There are so many things I will never take for granted again that we do all the time. Just the ability to walk out on a Friday night and see a full crowd, you know, see the student body, see the, all the things about Friday night lights that we all love. So many of them weren't there this year. So when they do come back, it, it'll be a great feeling. Week one is in the books. The Rough Riders bounce back big in week two with a 62 to 10 victory over Des Moines East. But it was the final game of the season for all Des Moines schools. Going back to that mantra of, of really when the pandemic hit is you're just, you're, you're trying to live every day, one day at a time, and, 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 and maybe, maybe looking a week ahead at a time at the most. And so I think in your head, you don't even give yourself the option that you're not gonna play, right? Because then you're thinking about things that are outside of your control. But certainly, you know, as, as, as time told, it, it wasn't in the, in the making. It doesn't matter what school you're from, okay? That is crushing, and, and I felt, um, really, uh, I really feel that was an unfortunate situation for, for those kids, and, and I don't want to point fingers at, as to who to blame for that situation, but the bottom line is kids didn't get opportunities. It was sad to lose games like that because, you know, they were trying to be safe. It, it seemed like it was a bit politicized at that time, you know, and it was unfortunate. You don't want kids to lose out on opportunities because grown-ups are playing politics, you know, and some kids did, unfortunately. While the season ended for some teams, other programs were just getting started. Harlan traveled 150 miles to Pella as two 3A Dome dynasties took the field. Communicate up front and let's have a night. Here we go, hogs on three, one, two, three, hogs! Oh, they're gonna come out with a ton of energy and it's on us! to match that right away. Yes, Clayburg, and he finds him right at the hash marks down the sideline. This is Clayburg. He's got plenty of running room and distance from the defender. He's gonna go all the way. The first play of the game is an 85-yard touchdown pass to Nolan Clayburg. Casper Bell, back to pass, looks left, fires. Complete. That ball's caught by Hall, he breaks a couple of tackles and now he busts loose and he's down the numbers down the sideline and he's gonna get in the end zone. The Cyclones go 65 yards. Casper Bauer, back to pass, fires right side, has a man in stride. That's Hall again. An 87 yard touchdown pass to Hall from Casper Bauer and just like that, Harlan strikes again. Mace. Straight back to pass, looking right side, once Knox deep, and he's got him! Right on the money to Jason Knox for the touchdown! 
Jasper Bauer. Back to pass. Right corner of the end zone. Caught for a touchdown. Give to DeYoung right up the middle and into the end zone. Seven yard touchdown run by Nick DeYoung and Pella's got this one closer. Second and 25 at the 47. High snap, no problem, Mace has it. Fires again right side, that one's gonna be picked off. That's an interception, that should wrap it up. Good job, good job, baby, good job. Lots to improve on, but baby, we're gonna be all right. We're gonna be all right. That a baby, that a baby, that a baby, that a baby. Some of the things change daily, and we never quite know what tomorrow's gonna bring, so uh, it's like I tell the guys, just play every game like it's it's the, the last one you're playing, because you never know. And, uh, you know, we're gonna keep trudging along and, and keep learning and uh, do the best we can each week. In Waukee, a much-awaited matchup between transfer teammates Dale Stout and Arlen Bruce did not happen. The Hawks Bruce is still waiting to be ruled eligible while Stout helps Waukee secure a victory with a game-winning touchdown. It was crazy. <laughs> I, I said before the game, I was like, man, what if he was the one that was the deciding factor in this game? I literally said that before. And next thing you know, his first catch of the game is the game-winning catch to beat us. I'm like, man, I, I'd never been so mad. I, I was happy for him, but I had never been so upset in my life. It was, it was crazy, man. I went, I went right to the bus. COVID remains a daily concern and the virus is still winning by temporarily shutting down some football programs and this leaves some teams weighing options they never considered. This is an example of how crazy this year was on the Thursday night before the open date that we were left with. I'm still on the phone talking to high school football coaches in Lincoln, Nebraska about playing the next night. So ultimately we just couldn't make the logistics work. We might have some games scheduled and then it changed at the last minute because it might be postponed or canceled. But it all worked out, you know, and I, it was good to see the kids compete. All of a sudden it didn't matter who you were playing, which was really interesting you know, when, you, when you get to it because a lot of the uh, a lot of the resistance uh, or pushback we get on schedules and things like that, uh, none of that mattered anymore. People just wanted to play. And I think I, I kudos to the coaches uh, who didn't, you know, just say, well, how are we going to prepare for that? You know, we've never seen them. They just said, these kids want to play and we're going to find a way to let them play. And kudos to the ADs for trying to find a way to make it happen. Uh, one thing we did learn is uh, people want to play bad enough, they'll travel. <laughs> There's obviously no connection between Indianola and Western Dubuque. I mean, we're talking 200 miles away that it just ends up being based on necessity. So we found what we found, and it's probably not easy to make that trip you know, on a Friday night knowing you're not going to get back till very late tonight. Let's show these guys down here. This is our brand of football. We're here to educate them. Everybody understand where we're at with that? Okay? Do your job and do it with a ton of enthusiasm. All right? Freaking play Bobcat football. Let's go. Second down now for the Indians. Keel fakes the handoff and he's sucked. Blindside tackle that time by Spencer Zinn for the Bobcats from the 16 yard line. Keel rolling right, looking, firing across the middle. Complete. McGinnis. And this is a direct snap to Kalarik who's just going to keep it himself and dive up and over the pile. That's in the end zone. That's a touchdown. Give is to Zinn, left side. Plenty of running room down the hash, down the sideline, all the way into the end zone. Great blocking on that left side for the Bobcats. Yeah, let's go! Bomb hover, under pressure, dances, keeps himself alive. Now he's got running room right up the middle, makes people miss, and now he's putting on the burners. He's gonna get in the end zone. 45-yard touchdown run on a broken play by Baumhauer. Hey, let's go! Fakes the handoff to Zinn, wants to go deep across the middle to the Soller, and he's got him right down the middle of the field, and it's going to be a touchdown. Just like that, the Bobcats strike. We had a lot of excuses this week, didn't we? We had to drive three and a half hours, a little behind on our schedule, a little behind on our routine, come to a different place, never been before. You guys did it the Bobcat way. I'm proud of you. In week four, Ankeny heads to Valley and the Hawks are still without Arlen Bruce. He's still waiting on an appeal to play. We were trying to get Arlen eligible, which wasn't working. I'm just like, man, when am I going to play again? I mean, 
I was so happy for my guys on the sideline, but I'm just like, man, I can't wait to get out there. He practiced so hard. That's the thing I noticed. I mean, I remember talking to his coach. He goes, coach, this kid's a warrior. He's a winner. And now the Tigers are without their starting quarterback. Jake Rubley is ruled ineligible. He finished the season with us, practiced every day, finished the semester at Valley High School and enrolled at the semester down at Kansas State. Ultimately, he was ruled ineligible, which was totally out of our control. We didn't agree with it, but we had to abide by it, so we did. Pivot is a word commonly used in basketball. In a pandemic, it has become a common term to adjust to the changes forced by COVID-19, and everyone is learning to pivot. Controlled chaos. <laughs> You have to sit on the X. Do I sit on the X or not sit on the X? I'm not sure. Is this where it doesn't have the X? Is that where I'm supposed to sit? Or am I supposed, you know, what, where is it? Oh, is it just groups of three or four? Can I, can we sit here? Can we, I don't know. Who knows? It, it's just crazy. I can't believe I'm hiring six security uh, personnel from CSC to monitor a crowd of 1,200. You know, uh, I can't believe I'm walking past a concession stand and the only thing that's available is popcorn and, and a snicker bar. First off, trying to have meetings with our AD and our coaches in safe ways. Uh, you can't just go crowd yourself into a small classroom anymore and, and to, to try to get that information from the AD to myself, to our coaches, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, at one point, we um, Laguna Bank and Polk City let us use their conference room, big, huge conference room. Each coach got their own table. We were about 10, 20 feet apart. And we, that's how one of our first staff meetings that we had to have this year was that way. You know, we had a situation where, you know, a college student wanted to come home for a weekend. Well, they brought it back with them and that wiped out a sophomore for, you know, 14 days. We didn't use a locker room the entire year. Um, our kids showed up to practice. They brought their gear from home. They walked straight to the practice field. Um, they walked straight to their car afterwards, you know, so there were some things that were really unusual. Big news in Ankeny, standout Arlen Bruce is ruled eligible and gets his first chance to take the field. So this was a fourth appeal. Travis calls me, I had my phone because I, I was, you know, he says, hey, he goes, no one knows, he goes, Arlen's eligible. I said, you're kidding. And he says, no, he goes, go tell him. So I take off running. <laughs> They're taking a test. I open the door, I said, hey, I need to see Arlen. And then he screamed, he's like, you're eligible. I was like, for real, like, I almost started crying. And he hugged me and picked me up. And then everyone, like, I went back in the classroom, everyone heard, and they like, were clapping for me, man. It was, it was crazy, I'll remember that forever. And I remember, I was actually, you know, unfortunately got a chance to see his first game, that first kickoff he took back, it was at home. And you could see just the excitement on the sidelines, those, the, the guys in Ankeny were like, hey, this is, this is our guy, we're gonna, we're gonna rally around him. So it was neat, I think it was fun. There are two weeks left before the playoffs begin, and most of the teams are adjusting. It appears the protocols are paying off. We found ourselves obviously masking. We found ourselves, uh, it's different of how we were going to use locker rooms. Some didn't use them. Um, I'd have hate to have ridden in a lot of cars the, during that time frame because that became some kids' locker room. We didn't see the kind of spread that maybe would have made us say, hey, wait a minute, we better you know, we better hit the pause button on this and get it figured out. For the most part, uh, we didn't see a great spread and we didn't see uh, 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 teams canceling at, at great rates. So uh, we got a little bit lucky, but I also feel like the things that coaches, again, coaches, players, administrators put in place really helped. In week six, two teams with dome dreams square off in a 3A battle as Grinnell hosts Cedar Rapids Xavier. Rex Roth running left with good blocking. Now he's wide open to the end zone. 12 yard touchdown run by Rex Roth. Hurry to the line, second and six at the 16. This is Lux, right side again, breaking tackles, cutting back, makes people miss. He's all the way into the end zone. You just almost take it day by day and week by week and just uh, you know try to do the right thing so you get to the next day. I think our guys just came over here really focused and uh, uh, we talked about having a business trip on the way over here and uh, I think they did. The final week of the regular season is now set. Dallas Center Grimes is still on top of the 3A rankings and headed to Winterset. And this season, the Mustangs instituted a unique travel plan. We did not take a bus to an away game this year. At the time, the fear was uh, a positive contact uh, and that kid was on a bus on Friday night. Anybody within six feet was gonna be a close contact quarantine. 
And so we said, you know, that, that's a really high risk to jump on that bus on a Monday night or on a Friday night and go. And so our kids rode to the game with their parents this year. We're not ready to put our kids in that situation where, okay, you get everybody on a bus, and all of a sudden you got to start taking a look at who's sitting around that kid. Okay, and now, okay, you're not playing, you're not playing, you're not playing. i got to put my starting quarterback here, my second string quarterback here, you know, to parents, take them, take them. And the only people I feel bad about in that situation were our bus drivers. They didn't get paid. Bottom line is, for the next three hours, like we talked about a week ago, we get to go play football. And everything inside those lines is normal. Alverson, back to pass. Plenty of time, fires, got Busby. Busby's in the end zone, 19 yard touchdown catch to Busby. Running to the left side, gets a block and sprints through it. Diving towards the end zone and he's in. 11 yard touchdown run by Forgy and Winterset jumps into the lead. And Alverson who looks left, fires deep, caught. That's Jones again with the touchdown. Boys, now we roll. Now we roll. This is what we have the Mustangs! It's playoff time. While the Mustangs will get a bye, Winterset is back at home, hosting the North Polk Comets. Playoff football is something special. You've been a great group to coach. You've been after it all freaking year, getting better. Okay, now it's time to show and prove it. We've been bobbing this thing, bringing our best, being 1% better. It's time to start being our best. Family of dogs, a lot of love for you, man. But it's time to go hunt, all right? It's time to go attack. It's time to go be the aggressor. We're gonna give it on off. Here's a run into the left side of the formation. That is, is Hegan Hanselman, who will take it to the house. Gonna be fielded by Capaldo at his own five yard line. Capaldo takes it from the five, has a running line. Capaldo up the middle, across the 40, across the 45, across the 40 again, 35, 30, down the sideline. North Polk's gonna take it to the house. Going right side, running it down. Here's a running line for Dawson Forby across the midfield. 25, 20, 10, 5, touchdown Huskies, Dawson Forgy. Survive in advance. Let's Bob this thing. Bob, get out. Let's go. Oh, boys. Oh, boys. Oh. This unknown journey came to an end for several teams that worked hard to make the dome run. After that game was over, you, you just kind of sit back and you think to yourself, man, all that stuff we did, and then to have it end maybe a little sooner than we wanted, it did take a little bit of time to, to get over that. We had a really talented team that it would have been a shame had they not got to play anything. And the fact that we got to play seven games, I look back now and I take, try to take in everything that's going on, not only in, in our community, but within our state and within, our, within the nation and the world. And the fact that we got to play football this year, is pretty amazing. The quarterfinal round of the playoffs is now set and the winners are dome bound. But there's breaking news just 24 hours before one of the biggest rivalries in the state takes place. The Valley and Dowling game is canceled. Our team was really clicking at that point. And then the next week we lost to an opponent we couldn't conquer and that was COVID-19 and our season was shut down. So it was, it was definitely a crazy year, but even today I am thankful we got to play. I think it, it tightens you down in everything that you're already doing right, okay? And it makes sure, you know, make sure that, okay, um, get those masks on kids in practice. You know, make sure we're social distancing. All right, you're thinking about going out to visit, you're not going anywhere, okay? Um, you know, make sure that you're taking care of your business and, and doing it to give ourselves a shot, you know? So I don't, it, it just, um, it definitely raises the uh, awareness when a team goes down like that. We have to assume responsibility for the reason we were shut down. We had gotten complacent. And at the beginning of the season, it was all about exposure to other people that might take players off the field. We, we weren't having any positive cases on our football team. Early that week, we lost two or three kids to exposure at home through a family member. The kicker was we had a couple of players who had been on the practice field that week who tested positive. And you talk about a contact tracing nightmare. By the time we got to practice that night, we had lost our entire offensive line. And we were still gonna play. We, we just said, look, it's important that we play this game. If we have to play with our sophomores, we will. 
but it got to a point where it wouldn't have been safe for us or fair to Dowling for us to take the field. So I just brought our team around and said, well, here's the deal. And um, it was unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we have had a level of disappointment because we wanted to play. And that game, I don't care when it's played, is special. We made the announcement before practice. There were tons of tears and frustration. And an hour and a half later, they're just walking around talking to each other. And we finally had to say, OK, we're going to go home. And that's how it ended. So as crazy as it was for us the way it started, the ending was probably just as nuts. It was just kind of so abrupt that everybody was just forced to deal with it. Ready, go! Eyes, 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 elbows in, elbows in! Break. The playoffs are still on in Waukee, and it's a rematch as the Hawks are back in town, and this time Arlen Bruce is suited up and ready to take the field. I want another week. You want another week? That's what we're playing for. I want to say like the, the first few games, people were like, yeah, this Arlen Bruce kid, he hasn't really done too much. I'm not that impressed. So I was like, all right, I, I got some for you guys. As soon as I got that first carry, I, I think I scored. But yeah, I just was running hard as I could. 31 yard touchdown scamper right down the hash marks for Bruce. The second game, we knew that they were going to be coming out for us because, I mean, we were the only ones who beat them. Takes the handoff, looking left. He's under pressure. It was sacked by Peterson. Their defense did well all season, and, you know, they kind of just, you know, kept us guessing all game. Bauer rolling left. Fires back to a wide open Bruce on the right side, and nobody's going to get near him. Bruce is one of the the better players I've ever seen play, you know, live. He can change a game in, in one play. He's a great athlete and, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna have a lot of success coming up here in, in his future too. I am so freaking proud of you boys, okay? We get to play another freaking week. How about this? Oh! How about yeah! yeah! Ready? One, two, three, four! The Hawks, one of 24 of Iowa's best football teams that are dome bound. Preparations begin for 12 semifinal games in three days. Attendance is capped at 2,500 fans per game. Those teams that had a chance to participate in the dome um, and compete in the dome, um, they were gonna compete really hard regardless of how many people were in the stands or not. And that was the, that's the cool thing about our coaches in the state and, and our kids in the state is just give me one shot at competing in the Dome and we're going to be okay. Been a lot of uncertainty ever since March of last year when the, the world shut down, I guess you could say it. Leaving us with no sports, no events. But as the, the, the weeks progressed, the months progressed, we started to see a peak of hope and, and, and hopefully having some stuff come this fall. And Iowa High School State Football Playoffs was the one. And we started prepping all the way back in the, in the summertime as to what we were going to do. Uh, obviously, plans change. Um, and a lot of different entities involved to make those decisions. Every kid wants that opportunity to play here in the Dome. I mean, that's what they grow up with. I mean, that's, that, that's another special part about the Dome. Every kid, uh, whether in grade school right now, or the Dome still means something. It still means uh, this is a special place, and this is a place I want to get to. Those dreams will continue with a plan now in place. As far as us, I mean, on the field lies, it's just, you know, sanitizing before and after uh, between games. Um, it's not rocket science, it's just, you know, it's something different. But like all those plans had to get submitted through the university and approved uh, by our safety office and, and uh, emergency management team, stuff like that. But being able to put those plans in motion created another problem. I didn't have a staff until about two, three weeks before we hit the semifinals. Um, and I had some kids that came back from a year ago, but uh, I didn't hire anyone new, just not knowing. So being able to pull that together um, and, and get college kids to come in and help us uh, to get through it. From you know picking up the stands and fogging the stands after every game was its own session, so we had to clear the dome after every game and do all that you know, four times a day. Three days of semis are set for the Unidome. Four games a day, attendance capped at 2,500 fans per game. Powerhouse Harlan highlights the first day 
The Cyclones seek a record 13th state title and advance to the title game with a victory. Let's enjoy this, baby. Let's prepare this week. Let's stay healthy. Let's do the right things. And let's go back here next week and kick some tail. Here we go. Our long-standing promise, Stein has yield, proven by research and strengthened by the expertise of our dedicated workforce. This approach has resulted in the highest yielding corn and soybean seeds in the industry. It's why we are here today, and it's what will continue to propel us and our growers into the future of agriculture. Yield plus our determination, innovation, and performance makes Stein a leader in the field. This is Yield Plus. Yield expected, yield delivered. Stein has yield. I really enjoy women's imaging procedures and enjoy connecting with women and providing their health care. So um, I tend to do mostly women's imaging procedures and interpretations. The focus that we have for patient care, it's uh, a group of people with integrity and compassion and work here because they really care about people and care about radiology. To be cutting edge for the patients and to be a part of a multidisciplinary team that provides exactly what a patient needs. So we, we really have people who are interested in doing a great job and stay current in radiology and care about getting to know people here and making the experience as comfortable as it can be. My name is Christian Farnsworth. I've been at Mackinac for three years now and uh, I'm on the intake building crew. The biggest reason I came to Mackinac is because I couldn't see myself going to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm a hands-on guy. I can definitely see myself at this place for a very long time. It's given me the financial freedom that I did not expect to have at 20 years old. I've been able to buy a house, buy a vehicle, start a little family of my own, and I'm only 20. So with our crew, our biggest motto is attitude and effort. So if someone is coming to work, has a good attitude and has a good work ethic, It'd be somebody that I'd be willing to hire on and give them a chance to teach them and guide them. If you're looking for a great career, apply today. Day two is underway without a hitch. In 4A, number one ranked Southeast Polk will move on to the championship game with a 50 to 10 win over Pleasant Valley. The Rams await the winner of Ankeny and seven-time defending champion Dowling Catholic. When you win 33 straight playoff games, good grief. You know, who's going to be the team that does beat them? The Maroons get off to a hot start and take a 14-3 lead into the half. Really what we said to our kids at, at halftime was just, hey, you guys are good players. Go out and make great plays. That, that's what good players do, or great players. Just, what do we have to lose? Let's go. I mean, we're down. And then, you know, we, we, we changed a little bit, but not much. Just go out and play. The Hawks rally in the second half and take a 17 to 14 lead. Dowling has a late answer and ties the game, sending it into overtime. The instant classic gets even better as both teams score in the first overtime. In the second overtime, the Hawks score first on this run by Jace Bauer. Now it's Dowling's chance to respond. We have a nickel package where me and Brody go in at DB, and uh, we are keen on uh, number two from Dowling all week. So I watched all his favorite routes, saw how he lined up. So I saw him look over the sideline. I saw his eyes get big. I could tell by his alignment he was, he was probably running a fade. But Ankeny's Arlen Bruce makes one of the plays of the season, giving the Hawks the victory. And I came down with it, it was just, it was crazy. I watched, I probably watched it on film like 50 times. I'm not kidding. <laughs> to be honest with you, I like how he carries himself on the field. He's, he's not arrogant. He looked like he loved to play the game. He looked like he loved his teammates. Um, I thought he did a great job for him. He is a class act, and he's a clutch competitor. We played our rear ends off and, and left it all on the floor. And, you know, win or lose, that's really what I've always talked to our teams about is, okay, let's, let's let it all hang out and then let the chips fall where they may. Well. For the first time in a long time, it didn't fall our way. All 12 semifinal games are completed without a shutdown. The finals begin in five days, and as they draw closer, COVID-19 numbers are on the rise. The games are in jeopardy, and now a proclamation from the governor has changed the championships. After the governor's proclamation, they switched to almost only two tickets per, uh, per, per player. 
uh, to have admittance into the dome. And, and that was hard to see, you know, not knowing that, you know, grandparents and brothers and sisters couldn't come, but uh, still being able to allow us to have those six championship games means so much to those kids and the coaches and the communities. You know, once you get inside a facility and the juices are flowing and you, you know, if you let a lot of people in that it's not a controlled situation, it could create a, a major issue, and nobody wants to be liable for that. Day one of the championships is on, with three titles on the line. 3A is all set as Harlan goes for a record 13th state title, while North Scott is in search of its first. The Lancers and their stingy defense were up to the challenge and hoist the school's first title in this historic season. Three champions are crowned, and now the hope is to get three more champions on day two without anything being shut down. You had that thought almost daily uh, during those five days, you know, and you're just waiting to see if uh, we can make it through the day and see if tomorrow would come. The final day of the 2020 season arrives. No news is good news. OAB CIG is a defending 2A champion moving down to 1A. Van Meter returns after being runner-up in 2019. The Bulldogs get off to a tremendous start and held the lead late into the fourth quarter. Then Iowa Hawkeye football recruit Cooper DeGene took over. He leads his team to a miraculous comeback that will not soon be forgotten. I'm glad we got to play. I mean, if, if we didn't play this year, I mean, I don't know what I would be doing right now. So I'm glad we got the chance to play and got the chance to bring home another state title. One, two, three, family. The final game of the 2020 season is set. Number one ranked Southeast Polk and the Ankeny Hawks. We were dressing when we played Dowling and uh, we hadn't seen Polk except on film. Well, they came running through. I mean, their kids when, in the semis, they were huge. I was like, just like, oh my gosh, dang. The Rams get off to an early lead, but Ankeny was battle tested. Coach Nelson expected his team to fight back in this unique environment. We're on the side where the parents are. You know, their fans are right there. Well, you know, we go one, two, three, punt, one, two, three, punt. You know, it was like cha-cha-cha going on. They score. They're just on Arlen, the parents. I just told one of the coaches, I go, man, I tell you what, they're picking at the wrong kid. <laughs> I go, you know, they better pick on somebody different because I go, he, it ain't going to be long and he, something's going to happen. And I go, it, it's, it'll be good for us, bad for them. Things do go well. The Hawks score three unanswered touchdowns and take total control. The Hawks put the game away late and win the school's third title. These folks were here to win. They, they didn't care if it was, might be considered an asterisk year, you know? They were here to compete and win. It was more electrifying than I thought it would be. Um, I thought it was good. Uh, I thought, the, I thought the, all the, uh, the participating schools, patrons did a fairly good job in social distancing um, and, and abiding by uh, the rules that were set forth in order to, to have those championships. But I, I still think it was a great experience for the kids to be here. There's something about winning a state championship in the Unidome and hoisting that championship trophy. I mean, it's, it's magical. I think it's a credit to all high school coaches. The fact that we were able to play and still get to the dome with the four teams in the semifinals in each class and then return the next week with championship, the championship round. Uh, that's an incredible feat. An accomplishment that may take years to measure. Generally speaking, I am super pleased with the state of Iowa and what we were able to pull off uh, this fall. Bottom line, they wanted to play. They wanted to play. And, and uh, they were going to do whatever they could or had to do in order to uh, um, accomplish that goal of, of not only just getting to the, to the starting line, but then getting to the finish line. Coming full circle back, if I remember some of the things we talked about in the fall, you know, we were talking about how you're going to navigate all this stuff. And uh, I remember telling uh, someone after our season was over that I felt like I coached three football seasons this year. When someone down the road uh, uh, complains or, or voices a concern about something that really is, is minor, uh, we can say, Let, 
let me remind you that you know a year ago, five years ago, whatever it was, um, we, we didn't get to take these things for granted. It'll be nice when we go back to the phone calls that people just call and say, we don't like your officials. <laughs> and uh, you know that would tell us we're back to normal. I think some of the things maybe we came up with are gonna end up being good long-term. And, and uh, you know, I just got done you know, meeting with all of our kids individually, which is something I do each and every season. And a lot of times our kids are going out for other sports and things like that, and it's difficult to find the time to meet with them. And being able to do it virtually uh, has become very easy and it was very convenient. So I got done with those, you know, probably a month sooner than what I, I would have otherwise. What 2020 did for us as a staff was really, you can sit there and, and, and fret about the past or find a way to continue to move forward. And I think, you know, even though we didn't get a season, I think we found ways to continue to provide hope and, and inspiration for our kids, which which to me was, you know, that's kind of our job as a head football coach. This year though, probably rates up there with anything I've ever done in, in athletics. We were gonna have fun regardless with those kids because they're so special. It, it, you know, if we, we it, obviously it's neat to win the state championship, but I'm just telling you relationships we have with those kids, um, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be mad if they don't invite me to their weddings. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I'm proud of the way they dug in, uh, just like Iowans do. Uh, they dug in and became problem solvers and said, you know, the important thing is to try to figure out a way to get these kids to play. How are we going to make that happen safely? You know, where we're not putting people at risk. We couldn't just say, let them play. We had to say, how can we do that safely so that we're being responsible uh, and still accomplishing what we want to accomplish. I went into the season saying, if we play two games, I'll take it. We ended up playing eight games. Uh, didn't get to finish it the way we wanted, but we had to play this season. I think it was critical for our kids and the communities. It gave everybody a sense of normalcy that we didn't have. Right now, we did get a play, and that's, I'm very thankful for that. It opened all of our eyes, coaches and players, admin and families. All together, it opened our eyes that it is a game. It's an important game, and at the end of the day, but it's, it's one piece of life. But that our team and our program can have positive influences on others. You know, the derecho and, and COVID and all these things that happened, our guys had to handle that, that constant adversity. And it was no longer about, uh, you know, making a fourth and one play or, or, you know, getting a stop on defense. It was bigger than that. And so the game of football, I think we used to, to help teach our kids how to be better young men. It was just, to me, it was amazing that we finished the season. I mean, got to play, what, 12 games, I think. So it was, ended up being probably one of the craziest seasons, but one of the neatest seasons I can ever think of in 36 years of coaching. A season that was unknown from the start ended in a journey that will be remembered by everyone who took on the challenge. Dome Dynasty was brought to you by